Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Rural Investment Media. Today, we're having what is largely a non-financial, more philosophical, more political, more general interest discussion with a longtime friend of mine, uh, Mark Victor. I first met Mark probably 30 years ago at the ARIS conferences, and I've followed his work uh, both as a political philosopher uh, and as a lawyer for probably 30 years. We became reacquainted this year at the wonderful Capitalism and Morality Conference in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I was struck by the simplicity of the organization that he is trying to get to put together, uh, if for no other purpose than to improve his world. Welcome, Mark. I'm delighted to share your thoughts with my audience. How are you today? I am fantastic, and uh, Rick, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be on your show and to talk to uh, the people who follow Rick Rule, so I'm uh, thrilled to be here. So let's give people a very broad overview of Live and Let Live. What is it from your point of view? What are you trying to accomplish? <clears throat> and how did you come uh, to this place in life uh, after a highly successful career as a criminal defense attorney? Well, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, I guess in short, uh, Live and Let Live is a global peace movement. And uh, we need a global movement. I uh, myself you know, became aware of the fact that we're facing some very serious global issues that we are not going to be able to solve locally uh, by, the, by the states themselves or even by any nation itself. I'm thinking about things like a nuclear proliferation, not only that, but the fact that technology will soon make it even easier for people to acquire nukes if they want them. I mean, imagine if anybody who wanted a nuke could get a nuke. I'm also concerned about artificial intelligence. I mean, this is coming. We don't know what the implications will be when we are by far not the smartest things anymore and how that might play out. We got to develop this technology responsibly. And also the pandemic got me thinking about this area of synthetic biology, where people with bad ideas can uh, soon be engineering horrible uh, viruses and things like that for bad purposes. So we got to get our act together globally. Um, and there, are, of course, are many other issues, people concerned about climate change and the like, and things we haven't even thought of yet. So we got to get the, re like I like to say, the reasonable people of the world together. Now, I recognize that people have different worldviews, right? I mean, even people who follow Rick Rule's investment advice have different worldviews on things. And uh, either we're going to be in a situation where we're each trying to coerce everybody else into our worldview, or instead of that, we sort of establish a minimum standard of conduct so that people who have different worldviews can actually get along in freedom and in peace. And that's what Live and Let Live is trying uh, to put together. I mean, the minimum standard of conduct, we call that rule number one, our legal principle. And I describe it with the very short phrase, just don't be an aggressor, which is really the rules we all learned in kindergarten, right? Keep your hands to yourself and don't take the other kids' toys. Don't put anybody in danger, those kinds of things. That's the minimum stand, right? Nobody should get to violate that. And this goes for everybody, right? I don't care what color skin you have, if you're rich or poor or what language you speak or holidays you celebrate or who you love. It also goes for groups and corporations and the government itself. There should be no exceptions to this rule, period. That's rule number one. But then rule number two, our last and final rule in uh, Live and Let Live is what we call our moral rule. And this is a dramatically different rule because this rule here is not a mandatory rule, unlike the don't be an aggressor rule that, you, that we don't care if you agree or not, you don't get to aggress. This rule here, we're seeking to inspire people, right? I described this one with the simple phrase, just be a good human. And we're talking here about things like open-mindedness and tolerance and voluntary kindness towards other people in civility, right? Even if we disagree, it's okay. We can do that in an agreeable way and building high levels of trust with other human beings and a commitment to truth and facts and rational inferences from those things and whatever the facts are, right? Even if they're different from what I currently believe. And the reason for this rule is our overall goals here. We're trying to optimize human happiness and well-being and also to minimize suffering. And so it's important to say that people are free to say, Mark, I don't care about any of that stuff, uh, to which we say, fine, if we can't convince you here, no problem. Live your life however you like. Just simply don't digress 
against another person. If we just adopted those two rules, right, as different as they are, one mandatory, one optional, uh, we could actually get to not just uh, freedom, but also peace and civility. We could increase standards of living around the world. The problems that we're able to solve right now with human action, I think we'd go a long way to get those solved. So that's really what Live and Let Live is about in a nutshell. And people can find out more about it. They just need to go to liveandletlive.org. And there's also a nonprofit in there, a 501c3. So if people want to donate, get a tax deduction to a slightly different organization that we call the Live and Let Live Foundation, they can do that as well through, through the liveandletlive.org website. So, Mark, how does a criminal defense attorney from, I guess you're in Phoenix now, uh, how does a criminal defense attorney, successful criminal defense attorney, uh, migrate from building a criminal defense firm to trying to save the world? <laughs> how, yeah, how does well, that come about? <laughs> well, it's a good question. I mean, I guess the short answer is I'm not just a criminal defense attorney. I'm also a citizen of the world, and I've got kids, and I'd like to see the world continue and again, I don't think that's an over, I don't think I overstated the case here. I think we are. Uh, look, our technology has advanced tremendously fast and is advancing even faster than our social development has. You can go back and uh, read things written 2,000 years ago, and what you find is we haven't really progressed that far socially, but we're in a situation now where smaller and smaller groups of people can do greater amounts of harm. So that's number one. Number two, you know, as a criminal defense lawyer, I get a front row seat to where the rubber hits the road, if you will, when the government puts people in cages. And so I get to see the very stark difference between uh, people who commit victim crimes, which are those who aggress, right? Everybody who commits a victim crime has violated rule number one, as I have just laid it out. And then victimless crimes, right? These are really moral crimes. These are things like, like prostitution, things like gambling, things like putting substances into your own body that other people don't find appropriate, these kinds of things. These are victimless crimes, or said another way, these are uh, violating other people's moral judgments. And so after seeing this over and over again and seeing the resources we're wasting that we take away from going after victim, people who commit victim crimes and then divert, and this is a substantial amount, Rick, I mean, to the drug war alone, uh, and I don't have, I'm sort of just 28 years anecdotally speaking here, maybe 50% of all crime is derived from the drug war, right? And some of it is violent because, you know, people are buying and selling goods now in the black market. There's no way to enforce contracts or go to court or things like that. So it brings violence. But to divert resources from real crimes, victim crimes, to fake crimes, moral crimes, has, it got me thinking over the years, why are we doing this? This is absolute foolishness. And we got to stop doing this because it's it's destroying us. And everybody's got different ideas about morality and people want to put that into the law. And uh, I've got to, you know, the price for this is I've got to say, look, even my morality, things that I think are good, like, for example, helping those who are less fortunate than us, right? Uh, welfare, those types of things. That's stuff that I support. But I got to take that out of the law. So I support that outside of the law. That's what I call voluntary kindness. We've got to take even our own morality out of the law if we want to get to freedom and peace. And that's the price we got to pay. If you're not willing to do that, then we're going to be in this endless fight where we're each trying to uh, force the other into uh, complying with our moral judgments. We got to stop doing this before it's too late. So, Mark, let's stay general for a while. Uh, my audience, about 80,000 people, uh, probably holds, uh, many of them at least, different political views than you and I. My audience aggregated themselves because they're interested in financial self-improvement rather than philosophy. Uh, let's talk, uh, as an example, about the non-aggression principle, which would seem to be the libertarian precept that live and let live grew out of. Uh, many people, I suspect, would like a circumstance where nobody else could express their will over them through coercion. But many of my audience who haven't thought about this as deeply or who hold different points of view believe that their point of view is so right and so valid that they have a right, at least collectively, if it's been approved through the democratic process, to enforce their rights or to coerce others. 
Can you talk a little bit about what you see is the inherent fallacy of that point of view and why uh, why a policy of non-coercion ultimately is at once more moral, but also more practical? Yeah, I think, I think just starting very quickly from the practical side of things, look to divorce political philosophy from economics and our own personal finances, as we're finding out right now, is false, right? I mean, there are consequences to this sort of reckless spending and printing money and all this stuff that's been going on that both parties are responsible for. And we are paying the price now. We don't even know how big of a price we will pay, but everybody is being hurt right now as a result of this recklessness. As to the sort of underlying justification, I think people generally understand what I laid out before and, and referred to as the kindergarten rules, right? You don't have a right to put your hands on anybody or force anybody to do anything. And most people just sort of get that point. There, there can be underlying discussions about why is that the case, right? People talk about natural law or their religious views or social contract. But if you get to the point where you say being an aggressor is the wrong thing to do, fine, welcome to the group. What I think people don't think through carefully is sort of the fact that even if we form a little group, right, if I get together with Rick Rule and some of our other friends, maybe Doug Casey and some other people, and we call ourselves some group, maybe even we, we give ourselves some funny hats and titles and badges and all of that stuff, we, don't, we still don't get to aggress, right? How on earth would we acquire some right to aggress? I mean, even if we form a group, the group only has the rights that we give it. We formed the group. So if you understand that as to a small group, well, a big group isn't any different, right? We shouldn't lose focus on what's going on. And the biggest group of all, the government, doesn't change anything. I mean, look, we wouldn't have a government if we didn't have people. The governments are created by people. We delegate the rights that we have to the government. And since none of us has a right to aggress against anybody else, even collectively, we can't delegate a right to aggress to the government. Therefore, the government as our agent, its rightful job is to act as our agent to do the things that we could do, which is defend ourselves and uh, things of that nature and enforce law. We can do this anyways, because that's what self-defense is about, right? I can defend myself. I can defend Rick Rule. I can defend anybody I want as long as I'm on the right side of that. But I can't aggress. That's the, that's the issue. So we're really just talking about thinking clearly and thinking consistently. Um, and again, you know, just practically speaking, if we're going to aggress, well, other groups are going to say, well, look, uh, there are other people with different moral views, right? Imagine people who say, I think women who go outside should wear headscarves. What do we say to them? We have only two things we could possibly say. Number one, we say what we're saying now, sorry, our morality goes into the law. We're going to do welfare and then anything else we think is appropriate. But your morality stays out of the law. And of course, this generates this endless struggle, which is what we're dealing with now. Or the other thing we might say to such a person, which is, look, maybe this is a very good moral rule. I don't pass judgment on that. But for the sake of, it, of getting to freedom and peace and civility, if that's a good moral rule, you should have no trouble convincing people, uh, in this case, women, to wear headscarves. And if you can't convince them, then sorry. Uh, you gotta, you got to convince and persuade people on morality. We take everybody's morality out of the law, yours, mine, everybody's, and there's just the minimum standard, which you might call the lowest common denominator of morality. Some people say, hey, Mark, you know, the rule against murder is still a moral view, fine. But that's the one that all reasonable people agree with. It is not reasonable to take a position that aggressing against another person is appropriate. So I suspect that most of the audience, the, the rural investment media audience that's uh, listening to this, uh, believes in some form of government. Probably most of them believe in less government. Probably most of them believe that a government that was organized around their own precepts is better than a government <laughs> organized around other precepts. When you say non-aggression, uh, I have seen many, many, many polls that have suggested that the average taxpayer wouldn't pay tax were it voluntary. The average taxpayer believes that everyone else should pay tax to support their social point of view. If social non-aggression uh, extends all the way 
to the sort of coercion by society to pay what society calls the common rent, the cost of government, the cost of police, the cost of uh, organized self-defense. In your circumstance, how does one fund even this lowest common uh, standard? Who makes, who decides the laws, and how do we fund that? It's a very good question, and it's one of the hardest questions, frankly. I've written quite a bit about this. Uh, people, by the way, can uh, see exactly what I've written about this on if they just simply go to my political website. As you know, I'm running for United States Senate at the moment in Arizona as a libertarian. Frankly, I'd rather be an independent because I don't feel beholden to anybody's political platform. I speak for myself. I'm really more of a lone wolf. But people could go to live and let live revolution.com click on the my stance button and then scroll down to where you see taxation and i give a whole long sort of dissertation on exactly how we could pay for these types of things but as a, as an initial matter i didn't say anything about uh, abolishing government or anything like that people have different definitions of what government is i don't really care about that my response on government is whatever you define government as as long as it is held to the same standard as everybody else, all groups, corporations as well, and people. Uh, it shouldn't get to aggress. And I think we could still get everything or virtually everything right now without aggressing against our neighbors, right? I mean, uh, virtually everything is already provided in the private sector. Even the things we think of that are very hard, like, for example, uh, fire protection. We've already had that here in Scottsdale. Rural Metro was a private for, prop for profit. We have lots of private security that uh, people hire. And, uh, you know, roads are made privately anyways. It's The government doesn't make the roads. It hires uh, companies to build the roads. And so all the traditional types of things. I think you have to view this question really in the context of a paradigm shift, uh, because you have to envision have some vision, right? How the world would evolve as we devolved coercion down and down and down and increased standards of living up and up and up. And so many of the things that people currently would have trouble uh, affording, you know, things like food, things like shelter, things like housing that people already get in the private sector, not provided by government, would be easier and easier in a more prosperous society. We're already moving in that direction. The people of the world are already getting richer and richer and richer as a result of the extent to which we have free market. So that's already happening. We want to we want to hasten that process. So fewer and fewer things are hard for people who have um, uh, lower means that are that. And there are people, by the way, who have physical disabilities, mental health disabilities. This is the legitimate role of charity and people are already charitable and we should champion that effort. That's why I can't talk about voluntary kindness. We should get better organized. We should help those people who need help. We just can't force our neighbors to help people here. We need to inspire them to help people here and raising standards of living is the best way to actually make that happen. Just for the record, I really agree with that last statement. I've watched it work myself in emerging and frontier markets for 40 years as people become more free to make their own decisions they become more rich that's very 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 clearly true i can't give you the statistics i can give you 40 years of anecdotal information but let's move on uh, at the beginning of this discussion you, you talked about uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, changing conditions in the world that have brought you to this point of view things like nuclear arms, the probability or possibility of uh, chemical and biological developments, uh, which could, could, as an example, come into the possession of criminal organizations or criminal individuals, and artificial intelligence. Uh, what do you say to two things? The first is uh, preparedness. If uh, an individual felt pot potentially threatened by a group, which may or may not be nuclear, nuclear armed, does that individual have the right to preemptive self-defense? Does that individual have the right to develop his or her own nuclear technology? Would you somehow coerce people to prevent them from utilizing artificial intelligence for their own purposes? Yeah. Uh, would you attempt to coerce uh, <laughs> uh, citizen biologists from developing pathological toxins uh, in their basement? 
Uh, and how would you make the decision as to what was an acceptable standard and how would you fund enforcement? Very good questions, things I've written about, and uh, I'll try to give a, a more of a summary type of an answer here. But some of these questions require more nuanced answers that take a little bit more time. So let me do my best here to try to address this as briefly as possible. What we're really talking about is what is the definition of aggression, right? I said very quickly, uh, you know, I'm always against aggression, but I didn't really define what aggression is. And we have to get a little bit into the weeds here, which is really my specialty as a criminal defense lawyer. That's what we deal with here. So the way I would define aggression is anybody who initiates force against another person or their property. That seems pretty obvious. Anybody who engages in fraud, anybody who engages in coercion. And then the sort of final category of what I would call a serious uh, initiation, a, a serious aggression is the category you're raising, which is the way we lawyers would say it was doing anything that creates a substantial risk of harm to another person or their property. Another way to say it, maybe a non-lawyer way, is you don't get to do anything that puts another person in danger. Okay, so bringing that back to the question you're asking. Imagine the uh, citizen biologist experimenting with deadly viruses in their basement in a residential neighborhood. Well, I think this pretty clearly, uh, especially under conditions, let's just say they have their seven-year-old watching their chemistry set up uh, when they go to work in the day or something. Uh, and so this is really reckless. This is classic recklessness that we would talk about in the law. And recklessness is generally illegal. That reckless driving, by the way, which is illegal in, I think, everywhere, is generally defined as driving your vehicle in a way that creates a substantial risk of harm to another person. Exactly what that means differs from community to community. We have reasonable standards here, like, for example, in Arizona, Somebody was charged with that and they were driving 120 miles an hour through a 35 mile an hour residential zone. They wouldn't get much of a fight from us. Um, but there, but there are there are harder questions. What if they're 50 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone? To the extent we can't agree about that, that's what engenders, that's how you get a trial, right? And then uh, you get case law and you have precedent and things like that. So I think virtually everywhere would say in the case of the citizen biologist recklessly experimenting with deadly viruses. This creates a substantial risk to other people. Therefore, that's aggression. They don't get to do that. Now, exactly where the line is on that, this is the legitimate need for regulations, right? Somebody wants to drive a truck through a residential neighborhood with uh, explosives, hazardous waste, things like that. It's okay to say, here are the requirements for the truck. Here's the training level for the driver. Here's how you got to strap the stuff down. Here are the uh, precautions you got to take so you don't create a substantial risk. So the nukes, nukes are sort of a special uh, category because I think you can take a position that all nukes, we should work to, towards abolishing all nuclear weapons. And the reason for this is they cannot be used in a way that doesn't violate the aggression rule because you always kill innocent people here. But as you move up the chain from say the 22 handgun to some of the things I fired in the United States Marine Corps, take a 50 caliber tripod mounted, belt fed, fully automatic weapon. I think if somebody doesn't know what end the round uh, exits from and uh, how to safely store the thing and all this kind of having a party with it out in their front yard and everybody's drunk, okay, this is creating a substantial risk of harm. So the community does have a right to say, sorry, you can't do that. Maybe they say, you know, you need to take a class that's uh, two months long so you can understand how to safely store the thing and produce a piece of paper from somebody competent that says, you know what? This person is safe with such a weapon or said another way, possession of this weapon by this person does not create a substantial risk of harm. If they can clear that hurdle, then I have no reason to complain about anything else anybody is doing. So that's the rub. I think that there are many hard questions. A mutual friend of ours, Walter Block, calls these continuum problems and says, well, there are very hard uh, areas all along the continuum here to figure out exactly when somebody's violating the rule. And when you encounter these types of problems, what I say is let's let the local community select within a reasonable range of choices here, and they'll select which reasonable construction of the rule they think is best. And then let's get market forces 
on that choice. If people are very upset, they can move out of the local community. They can refuse to do business with the local community. And this way, we'll sort of coalesce around what the better rules are. And as there's less dispute, maybe this kind of a rule now moves up to a little bit higher level. Maybe it's a state rule now. And when there's no confusion, like for example, punching somebody in the face without provocation, this is an easy one. This could be the rule across the whole nation. You don't get to punch somebody in the face without any sort of an argument of self-defense here. That always violates the rule. There's no there's no dispute on that rule. It's the harder questions that go in the local communities. So look, there, I don't want to make it too simple here. I think it's important to emanate from principles. We have to have the right principles at the foundation of the analysis, but then applying that to the countless factual situations that we get in the world. And I know that's what I've been doing for the last 28 years. There are many hard questions, but there are good mechanisms to get them resolved at the local level. We should we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We already have a justice system that knows how to adjudicate these types of rules and then set up case precedent and go from there. We already got different definitions of even what a murder is from state to state, from state to federal. We have different definitions, it's okay. Uh, we get by just fine and life continues to go on. So I'm beginning to see a common thread. You're a, you're an attorney. Could you define for my uh, audience what a tort is? Yeah, excellent. Uh, and and describe describe property rights and torts in the con in the context of live and let live. Excellent. And by the way, this is another one of those issues I've written quite a bit about. It's on my political website under civil issues. Um, and you know, I said serious violations of the don't aggress rule. There's also less serious violations. I call these civil violations and a tort is one of them. A tort is simply a civil wrong. It's different than a criminal wrong uh, in the sense that, you know, punching somebody in the face intentionally or even recklessly, that's a serious violation. We call that a crime and you could actually go to jail, but you might still punch somebody in the face accidentally, right? Maybe you bumped into them and you were, you were you know, putting your fist in the air because you were cheering for your favorite sports team and you, you didn't recognize somebody was staring right there and you punched him in the face. That's still a violence, that's still aggression, but it's not the kind of aggression that we put somebody in jail for because it's done negligently. Negligently just means you did it unreasonably. You weren't consciously thinking about it, right? This is your typical car accident case. That's a tort. It's a civil wrong. We can still right those wrongs. If you bump into somebody accidentally with your car, you've committed a tort, but still you're responsible for the damages. It's okay to say, hey, this person owes that person money because they caused harm. Property rights as well. Uh, look, everything is property rights. I, I like to talk about people being in charge of their own body, property, money, and time, and that's all true. But I could simply say property because we could we could define property very expansively to, to include your body, all of your money, all of the sort of things you have peacefully acquired uh, in life, and of course your time and all of that. So that's really what rights are about. In fact, I could summarize everything I'm saying into you should be the iron-fisted dictator of all of your property. You get to do anything you want with it so long as you don't aggress against another person because now that deprives another person of doing exactly the same thing with their property. That is how you violate another person's rights to be in charge of things. You aggress against them. If you're not aggressing against them, then you're not violating their rights. And so on the simplest level, that's how that plays out. We do need lots of rules around property, right? There's a theory of property out there. I own my body is a claim of property. Uh, how we acquire property, how we define that. There's lots of rules in there about property. What's a deed? What are the property proper elements of a deed? How do we convey deeds? This is already very well worked out in property law. And also contract law is very important too. What's a contract? What are the elements of legally enforceable promises? There's very little actually that I would change in the entire body of property law, tort law, contract law. In fact, how we process trials is pretty pretty done pretty well. Criminal procedure isn't too bad. Uh, how we how evidence law wouldn't change much. Really, what we're talking about here is taking victimless crimes out of the law and getting rid of regulations that are not calculated to sort of uh, further the underlying principle, this don't aggress rule we're talking about. But yeah, at, at a simple level, I can say don't aggress. 
But I enjoy the discussion into the weeds, exactly what is aggression, when is one person creating a substantial risk about another. That's what I do for a living. And we, we, we're never going to get away from lawyers, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective here. I, I want to go down this rabbit hole a little further. Okay. In, in two regards. Uh, one, uh, I saw a sign. I was in Southern California not too long ago. And I saw a sign uh, on the wall that said, curious about the afterlife? Uh, trespass on this property and you'll find out. <laughs> uh, is that a threat? Uh, in, in other words, they're, I mean, I have my own point of view. They're telling people not to trespass and they're telling them that there will be an armed response uh, if they do. Uh, that goes, I think, to the whole uh, discussion of gun rights, which I suspect that my audience of 80,000 people is broadly supportive of. Uh, so, so to answer your question, that, that's definitely a threat. But, you know, you get into some gray areas about free speech, right? And so this is why when we're talking about self-defense, we're not just talking about a threat. We're talking about a threat, an imminent threat, right? A substantial and imminent threat to cause harm. Now, I will say, uh, if the per if, if if this threat was carried out, right, somebody simply trespassed across the property, maybe even to steal a television set, and this person actually killed them, which is to carry out such a threat, I think in all places in the United States, they will be deemed to have used uh, excessive force. And now they're acting unreasonably because as a general rule, you don't get to use deadly physical force to, to protect property or trespass to property. Now, this is, of course, where we lawyers come in, right? Because right. how this is characterized is yet another question. But, but generally speaking, you get to use only that amount of force that is reasonable because, you know, you could sort of imagine a situation where the person who's trespassing is the Girl Scout who's coming to deliver the cookies and she made a mistake about the address and she knocked on the door and nobody answered. So she walked in to drop off the cookies and now she gets shot and killed. Uh, that's that's going to be a hard one to defend, right? Because you don't get to use deadly physical force in response to a trespass. You can make that generalized threat out there without violating the rule on aggression. But if you actually follow through on it, now you've got problems. We get into the same issues with conspiracy, which is why you can make an agreement to do something illegal. But generally speaking, you have to have what we call in the law an overt act. You need to actually do something to further that purpose, to get you out of a First Amendment protected speech and into now action where we can say the rule has been violated. And since you don't mind getting into the weeds. Not at all. Let's go back to torts. Uh, and let's talk in environmental law about natural resource law, about the export of deleterious materials, uh, tainted water coming out of a mine site, dust coming out of a mine site, crossing po property lines. Can you talk about, uh, is that a tortious offense? What is that? Yeah, I don't know why we have such confusion over this. These don't seem like very hard issues to me. Again, I'll just point people to my political website, liveandletlivevolution.com. If they click down to the uh, issue of climate change, they'll see exactly how I analyze this question. And uh, look, if you're polluting, what that means is you are trespassing on somebody else's property. Now, not all trespasses are actionable, right? So for example, if we're neighbors and uh, I'm cooking a hamburger and you can smell it on your property, I'm actually trespassing on your property. I'm trespassing a smell. There are trespasses of sounds as well, right? Imagine I'm having a party on Saturday afternoon. My kids are jumping in the swimming pool or something and you can hear this next door. That actually is a trespass of sound. Is it actionable? Probably not. We call that de minimis. In the law, that means, yes, we recognize there's a trespass, but you know what? It's too small of a trespass to, to have the law issue an injunction. Now, if you change the facts a little bit and it's 3 a.m. and now you're hearing a loud party, that becomes actionable. If my, my barbecue is now not just bringing a little bit of smoke, but there's this big pile of smoke coming across and you can't use your property, no longer de minimis. So what does this mean in the climate change area. Well, if it's true that the climate is actually changing and this is creating a risk of harm and this is what's contributing to it is burning of fossil fuels, well, then you can say this is no longer a de minimis trespass. And the good news is we can actually calculate the price to remediate that trespass. 
If you're putting carbon into the air and you are trespassing it out into the environment, we can now calculate exactly how much you're putting there from burning a gallon of fossil fuels and how much it costs to take that carbon out of the atmosphere. There are calculations that people smarter than me in the science realm know how to do, and they can say, here's the cost to plant a tree or to take the carbon out. And I'm okay with assessing that cost to the trespasser because as any trespass is dealt with, there are two ways to deal with it. Number one, stop trespassing, or number two, buy an easement to trespass. So while I would not call this a tax, I would call it a trespass fee. And if you're trespassing, stop trespassing or pay for the damage to remediate the trespass. I don't think that's unreasonable at all. So let's move now to your uh, Senate race. <clears throat> for years, people have looked at my political views, and at least those who have agreed with me have suggested that I run for office. My response has always been, if elected, I would demand an immediate recount. Uh, I stole that from Carl Hess, of course. Uh, you're running for Senate uh, as a libertarian. Uh, do you hope to win or do you see this as a sort of a pulpit? Well, both. Uh, I would love to win because I would use that opportunity to get the word out. I don't think that getting uh, the right person in the United States Senate is going to fix our problems. While this might uh, result in sort of uh, stopping some legislation that on balance should be stopped or uh, getting some legislation through that on balance is better than not. I, I concede that point. I think the problems we have are now much bigger than that. I think we really need a global uh, revolution in how we think about not just politics and government, but how we interact with each other. And this is a much bigger project than just about who wins uh, a Senate seat, even in a, in a very closely divided Senate, which I recognize is still an important issue. But it, that the, the importance of that issue is dwarfed uh, by the importance of getting our collective brains around a philosophy that would allow people with different worldviews to peacefully live together. So whatever helps me get the word out to the, what I'll say, the reasonable people of the world, because we don't need everybody, right? The American Revolution is estimated to be about a third of, supported by about a third of the people, was opposed by about a third of the people, and about a third didn't really care. Uh, I would say that uh, we probably need a lot less than a third of the people today because generally the people who agree with the things that you and I are promoting are, are by definition the more successful people in the world, right? These are people who keep promises, people who voluntarily interact with other people. That's what we're promoting, right? Certain principles that work. And so these people generally are more productive, more influential. If we could get 10% of these people together and say, you know what, we need to change the world. Let's live, leave it better than we found it. We'd be well on our way to changing the world. So to be clear, my goal is to lead a revolution, a global revolution around a philosophy that we call <clears throat> live and let live. To that end, I am running for United States Senate. I happen to be running on the libertarian platform. I generally agree with the philosophy um, but I wish I was running on an independent platform. It would have cost far more money to be on as an independent. I don't like the baggage that comes along with being a libertarian because there'll be people even listening to this podcast saying, oh, a libertarian, I know what that, I know what they're about. They probably don't, um, but I speak for me. Uh, I don't speak for anybody but me. And if people agree with what it is I'm saying, I would urge them to simply join the Live and Let Live movement, right? Check the box. Go to the site, check the box that says, Mark, I agree with rule number one and rule number two, and add your name so we have enough people similarly to like the NRA does, right? Where they say, we speak for millions and millions of people, and they get things done. When we can speak for millions and millions of people in the Live and Let Live movement, hopefully we'll have enough influence we can get things done. Whether that is just getting hearts and minds one out in the world, which is where I think it needs to start. That's how things will start filtering into government. We, we shouldn't look to politicians to lead. They don't lead. They, look at marijuana, for example. They didn't lead the charge to legalize marijuana. The people changed their mind about this, and then politicians followed suit because they wanted to keep their seats. We need to focus on the real mission. To have a real revolution is about changing hearts and minds. It's not about getting people elected to office. But let's continue with the election for a second, because I think people will be interested. I suspect, 
as you know, I'm not Democrat. I'm not Republican. I'm not even a libertarian. Um, there will be, I suspect, in the American part of my audience, a preponderance of, quote, small government Republicans. What would you say to the suggestion that you're doing more harm than good in the sense that you're preventing the election of a Republican candidate from a state that might be Republican uh, in a very, very, very closely contended sentence, uh, pardon me, uh, Senate, uh, the sort of more harm than good doctrine. What would you say to that? Yeah, I understand that concern. I faced it 10 years ago when I ran for office and I was running as a libertarian. Then I ran against the Republican Jeff Flake and the Democrat Rich Carmona. And people said, Mark, you're going to take votes away from the Republican, which incidentally, not really sure is uh, completely accurate. I get lots of emails from people who uh, support Kelly, who are afraid I'm going to help get masters elected and vice versa. So I don't know that it's entirely even, but certainly without a question, I'm drawing votes from both sides. Uh, but I listened to those voices last time and Jeff Flake got elected and he did six years in the Senate. The six years came and went and we were still arguing about the exact same issues. I wish we could fast forward, right? Because if Blake Masters gets elected uh, to the Senate, we know what's going to be the case in six years. We're going to be talking about exactly the same issues. The same will be true with Mark Kelly, right? There might be, like I said, some bill or, or uh, some legislation that's passed or not passed, but this is not the kind of real revolution that we need. So what I'm saying to them is, while it might be true that there could be some incidental short-term type of a benefit until, of course, uh, the next, the other party controls things, which will certainly happen. The pendulum goes back and forth. I'll point out the Republicans just had control of everything. They had the presidency, they had the House, they had the Senate and the Supreme Court. And what did we get? We got more spending, we got more debt. Uh, we didn't get anything fixed. And so I think that it's time for us to say, look, the answer here is not the Republicans or the Democrats. Uh, when, incidentally, I don't even know what the Republicans stand for anymore. It seems that that party, the party of Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, that has been hijacked by a party now that I don't know what the principles are. In fact, it was Donald Trump who uh, passed the some of the largest tax and spend bills ever, two of them. In the history of our world, he put tariffs on. And so there were lots of things that were done. And he did some good things as well, to be fair. But these were minor changes, not the kind of major, big, shaking changes that we need to get us to freedom and peace. So I think we should focus on the much bigger picture, which is uniting the reasonable people of the world. And when I say reasonable, I'm not talking about the radical right, and I'm not talking about the radical left. I'm talking about the people left. Uh, in the center here, on both in both parties, who say, you know what, we need to get along. I don't like the woke left. I don't like the radical right. I think we could do better to just focus on freedom and peace. And we actually need to bring some civility back. You'll notice in the debate, I didn't call anybody names. I uh, I called people out when I disagreed with them, and I also uh, signaled agreement when I think they said something correctly. I've said to my team, I'll never do anything negative. I, I have enough to talk about just with what I'm for uh, than bashing other people. I think it's disgraceful what politics has become today. And I think we do need uh, to return back to civility and kindness and uh, the, you know, treating each other like brothers and sisters. Geez, we're on the planet for such a short time. We, we, we gotta find ways to get along. We should treat each other better. Mark, the polls suggest in um, Arizona that you're the favorite candidate of about 15% of the voting population. One might suggest that your percentage of the non-voting population, that population who doesn't feel represented by either Democrats or Republicans, would be larger. That would be speculative and anecdotal. But it would seem that what you are talking about it, it, uh, occupies a, a larger percentage of the population than is widely recognized. Could you talk about that? I realize that there's no pollsters that uh, that poll for none of the above, but could you talk about the market share uh, of your mindset? Yeah, in fact, I'll go further than that. I think if everybody was fully informed, if they knew everything that I was actually saying and they understood it, they also knew everything Blake Masters was saying, whatever he's saying, or Mark Kelly, same with him. If they knew everything about everybody, 
I have great confidence I would win in a landslide because it's simply unreasonable to not agree with what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we shouldn't aggress against other people. And again, I say this with, with the utmost seriousness, right? To not aggress means you, you got to use the other tool that's available, which is words, which is speech. That's reason. That's what it means to be reasonable. To aggress against another person is to not be reasonable, is to use force. And so I say with a very straight face, to disagree with what I'm saying is to be unreasonable. There are only two places to disagree with me. Number one, no, Mark, I understand what you're saying. I'm still for aggression. I want to aggress against other people. Oh, okay, uh, that's an unreasonable position. Or number two, Mark, I just don't like any of this good human stuff. All right, I guess you could say that too. That's fine. Th those are the two places to disagree with me. So I think the numbers would be a landslide for me. Now, the 15% thing, uh, I don't know if it's going to stay at 15%. This is unprecedented uh, in Arizona, really, for a third party uh, especially a libertarian that people have ideas about already to hit such a high number. But, you know, I get a lot of emails from people, lots of them every day that say things like, Mark, I love you. I love what you're saying, but you can't win. And so I'm going to vote for the guy on the right or the guy on the left. So I don't expect that 15% will hold by the time we get to election. Plus, as you said, there's a lot of Rick rules out there and Doug Casey's who just simply say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to register my vote in the group of people who don't vote. Uh, and I get that too. I think I would get a lot of those votes uh, if people knew. But again, my goal, my main goal, and, and to be clear, if I got into the United States Senate, it wouldn't be very long before I was easily the most well-known senator around the world. Because I, see, I don't change what I'm saying. I've been saying the same things for 30 years, and I don't care who's given me money, and I don't care what group I'm speaking to. I'm saying the same things, and I, and I feel confident about that because I put my principles out there. The only place to disagree with me is either on the principles or a legitimate place you could say, well, Mark, how you're implementing the principle I disagree with. Fine, that's a terrific discussion. If there's a better way to implement those principles, I'm all ears. I, I want to implement those two principles in as efficient and fair and just a way as possible. So again, if I got into the United States Senate, I would talk to everybody. I'd be on the couch at Fox News. I'd be on the couch at CNN. I'd go to MSNBC. Hell, I'll talk to the Chinese communist if they'll talk to me. There's no group I wouldn't talk to. I'll go into the devil's den and talk to everybody. I'm trying to win hearts and minds. But again, getting elected isn't the thing that's going to solve our problems. And I won't shade anything I'm saying to get one more vote. I'm going to say exactly I feel the philosophy of what I'm presenting is good enough. In fact, it's kind of fun because I'm saying as a politician, I got no signs. I got nobody holding any signs. We didn't do bumper stickers. We didn't do shirts. We didn't do buttons. I have none of that. I didn't run one commercial. I'm a guy with a good idea. And I think the strength of the idea, the philosophy, is what will carry the message. I think you saw that in the debates, right? You saw I was the guy with the ideas saying different things, and the other two were just yelling at each other about they could have just simply run their 30 second commercials over and over again. And I didn't learn anything. In fact, uh, to the people who say I should step down, and there are many of them to that group you mentioned earlier, I have put a video out there where I've spoke specifically and directly to Blake Masters. And I've said, look, I would like to have a public conversation with you. Let's sit down. I don't want to do anything behind closed doors. I think everything should be open and transparent. I don't like backroom deals. Let's have a fair, full, open, civilized conversation, mano e mano. And the two ways you can get me to step down are as follows. Number one, if you convince me that me stepping down and endorsing you is a better path to getting freedom and peace and civility. That's exactly what I will do. And so I, I don't know what Blake Masters is actually for, but I'd love to learn about that. So let's have a conversation. Number two, if after that very public conversation, my poll numbers go down, and I don't want to guess about this. I said, let's take the first three polls that come out, take the average. If there's a minus by my name, I will step down. So, so far, no takers on that. I will say Blake Masters did personally call my law firm to have a conversation, but he was informed Mark's interested in a public conversation, not a private conversation. So if you are among those people who want me to step down so Blake Masters gets elected, talk to Blake Masters. I'm happy to have a very public conversation with him virtually anytime, any place. The only rules are it's me and him and a camera person 
and no script, no moderator, no time limit. Let's do two, three hours or something like that. Let's have a real exchange of ideas. Next question would be, assuming we've moved beyond uh, electoral politics now, uh, if somebody wants to know more about what it is you stand for, how do they do that? Super they easy. Yep. Look, if you Googled Mark Victor, you would see speeches from probably 20 years ago. I'm saying the same thing, but. But nobody wants to call it that. How, where can they go where it's been done for them? Liveandletlive.org. If you want to find out what Live and Let Live is about, what I'm saying, go to liveandletlive.org. If you want the political campaign, go to liveandletlivevolution.com. And by the way, that will be the uh, sort of mothership political website for people all over the world who are going to run as Live and Let Live candidates. We've got chapters of Live and Let Live now. We've got 10 countries in Africa, lots of different chapters throughout Europe, and we've got chapters in Canada, throughout the United States. So I would really encourage people, if you like what I'm saying here, go to liveandletlive.org, understand what it's about, click the box that says, I agree with the two rules. It's free. Join the movement, right? Blast it out to everybody you know, encourage them to join this global peace movement. And then if you can get more involved, you can start a chapter, you can donate money, you can reach out and say, hey, Mark, I really like this thing. How do I get involved? I may run again for U.S. Senate under exactly the same. I could run as a Democrat, a Republican, a Green. It would make no difference. <laughs> and if somebody wants to support me to get out there and run again, I will say exactly Exactly the same things next time. I know that there is a race coming up here in Arizona in two years. Kirsten Cinema is up. She's a Democrat. I'm sort of toying around if I don't get elected this time, running as a Republican next time under exactly the same live and let live platform. I don't care what the Republican Party platform says. I don't care what the Libertarian Party platform says. In fact, to the extent they say anything different than I'm saying, my position is they're wrong, and I'm happy to have a discussion about it to explain to them why they're wrong. Finally, Mark, one of the most popular features uh, of my own site uh, has been book recommendations. Can you name two or three or four books uh, that people could read that you think would be useful in their development and useful too in causing them to under understand the efficacy of the Live and Let Live movement? Wow, that's tough to narrow it down to a few. Well, first off, I really liked uh, the book that Matt Ridley did, a, Rash a Rational Optimist or The Rational Optimist. I thought that was an excellent book. I like, Agreed. yes, I like some of the work uh, from Professor Pinker uh, from Harvard. Enlightenment Now is an excellent book. I think he brought, brought a lot of the case for why we should be optimistic about how the world's going. I'm a big fan of Sam Harris, even though I don't agree with everything he says. I think Sam's an excellent thinker. Uh, I also think in terms of economics, I think uh, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson is a book I recommend quite often. I like what Walter Block did with defend. If you want a wild read, right. uh, read Walter Block's Defending the Undefendable. I thought that was an excellent book as well. Um, but anyways, I'm a fan of all of those books. Uh, Noel Harari did a book, I think, called Species. Uh, that was a very good book, an excellent read as well. So, uh, yeah, all, all of this is good. Ain't really anything free market economics. If you want to really get into the weeds, you can read uh, on Mises. Uh, or, or even um, Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, I thought was an excellent read as well for economics. And in von Mises, human action, or what would you what would you recommend from von human Mises? action? Is a tough slide. I think it it's, it's tough to get through that one. Depending on, oh, actually, Murray Rothbard uh, made I think a think a very compelling case in uh, For a New Liberty. I think that's a very good read as well. Uh, the Tannehills, I forget their first name, maybe Linda. Uh, they, they they did a nice book on uh, freedom. I, the name escapes me at the moment, but uh, that was also an excellent book. So uh, that's probably enough for them to chew on right now. But uh, all that reading was great. And, you know, read it with your open mind. I say hey, everything I say, don't take anything on faith. Right. You figure out for yourself if you think uh, we can live together and have a civilized society and still be productive without forcing our neighbors into doing things. I think we can. I don't think we need to hit each other over the head to have a civilized, productive, organized, prosperous society. I think we can get along just fine without coercing each other into doing things. If you disagree with me there, we should have a discussion on it. Feel free to reach out. I'm easy to get a hold of. 
you can get a hold of me through my my law firm website, <clears throat> which is attorneysforfreedom.com. My and you can check out what we're up to there. My I have a pro freedom law firm. All my lawyers are freedom activists. We take on freedom cases. Uh, but but easy to get a hold of at Mark M A R C at attorneysforfreedom.com. And especially if you disagree with me, just bring it civilized. You'll get a response from me, no problem. Mark, thank you uh, so much, first of all, for your activism, but secondly, for sharing your point of view uh, with our audience. I was struck, uh, I guess, with your uh, litigator's sense of clear communication. Uh, I think you're a wonderful advocate for all this. So I'd like to thank you for all you're doing, and I'd like to thank you, too, for sharing it uh, with the Rural Investment Media audience. Delighted to have had you on today. No, it's a real honor and a privilege to be on your show, Rick. I've been a, a big admirer of yours since we met, probably 30 years ago at that awesome, the best conference ever, the Eris Society Conference, where you could literally say anything about anything. And uh, you always met interesting people there. Lots of times you disagree with them, but I, I found myself swayed by many of the people there on many issues. So uh, I've been a big admirer of yours. Thank you for everything that you do to contribute to really just improving life on planet earth. I think that's what we're all about. And maybe we all have a moral obligation to do that. I hope your audience feels that way. And I hope they'll at least check out Live and Let Live. And thanks so much for letting me share what it is I'm up to and what we're up to as a global peace movement. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank you and goodbye. Peace, brother.